let's get started. Um, so, one of the things we did on uh, last class was, was we saw uh, a kind of forum for political debate, um, much in long form. Actually, I think the um, the next uh, Tavis Smiley uh, State of the Black Union Forum, I think is going to be this weekend. Uh, it usually appears on C-SPAN. Uh, you might want to look it up if you look up Tavis Smiley. Uh, conversation should proceed much in the same way the one uh, that we saw. Do I need to turn this down? Just a little bit. Okay. Um, so the conversation should proceed much in the same way as the, the one we saw. So you'll see a similar use of kind of black ideologies, um, probably absent black conservatism uh, in that forum. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting is I, I, I sent you guys out. Um, and in fact, so that's one form where we see black ideologies on display. Another form is on uh, in our sort of um, and one of the things is people sometimes ask me, one of the things to think about is sort of in terms of political communication, some of you guys sent me different emails, is about how do these shows work. And in particular on the conservative side, um, the way, so you guys saw me with uh, Amy Holmes. Um, so just, just to show you kind of, just to explain to you where sort of um, Amy Holmes comes from, um, there was an organization created by, um, in, the, in the early mid-90s, created by um, very deep-pocketed conservative foundations who gave you know, several million dollars each, called the Independent Women's Forum. Um, there's a, there's another woman who appears on MSNBC, a black woman, a conservative black woman, an attorney. She's currently the president of the organization. Amy Holmes was one of the founding members. She graduated from Princeton. Um, and they took her sort of, uh, attractive young black woman and they, what the, what the independent forum does is, is supposedly independent though it's, you know, they advocate free market policies against welfare, uh, a bunch of other kinds of things, a, a, a series of conservative positions. What those organizations do is, is they take someone like Amy Holmes, uh, she gets, she's drilled constantly by media um, shows and then consultants also develop relationships with the bookers. Um, so, in a given morning, CNN is like, okay, here's the stories of the day that we're going to be covering. And, and that's evolving as the day goes. So, people develop relationships. What, what do you need? We have, you know, Holmes or and they can talk about X. Uh, or they can talk about why. And then one of the things that the independent platform has been good at is actually getting, say for instance, like now Amy Holmes is actually hired by CNN, um, and Michelle um, Bernard is actually hired by um, MSNBC, so they actually work for the station. They're not just being booked there as experts, they actually now uh, get a check, so they've moved over. But for a while, um, they're basically paid by this organization that's raised millions of dollars from this conservative foundation. And so what, what you'll see is, is that before Amy Holmes comes on, what's happening is, is she's on her way to the studio and she's talking to her media consultant, uh, whoever works at the, the Independent Women's Forum, and what they will have done is they will have written up a set of talking points for her. So she's in the car, she's rehearsing her talking points. Uh, no, I mean, people are, people are joking about this. Uh, and so when she gets there, um, so she, she's prepared. And then that person is also drilling her on how, say, for instance, OK, you're going on with Rick Sanchez. This is how Rick Sanchez interviews. This is what he likes. This is what he doesn't like. Um, here's what I want you to, here's how you handle him, and here's how you get more sort of camera time. So one of the things is if you guys saw, uh, uh, if you guys saw that um, interview, 
one of the things I can show you is is that there's another um, there's another uh, a guy Republican strategist uh, African American Ron Christie. Uh, one of the things I can show you is if you saw the exact same talking points that Amy Holmes does almost verbatim. Um, and so and, and one of those things is that you can see that there's been a, there's been a kind of preparation. So they've been delivered these talking points by who prepare them, and then they then they go on there and they and they, and so their job is to essentially recite the talking points of the people who are running these conservative foundations and and pay their salaries. Unlike you know me, who just kind of says what he thinks because and you guys saw me. What was I doing that morning? I was here teaching you guys in class, right? Because uh, they don't really have other jobs. Um, this is their job is to get into these forums and talking points. Um, so they are they're a mouthpiece for certain things. So I'll play you Ron Christie, um, and you can see the the use of the exact same talking points that Amy Holmes used. Let me let me actually pause for a second and let it spool up. So okay, so what are the talking points? So what what are his talking points? Yeah. Right. And then the, the second, the, in the exact same order, um, all there was a chimpanzee that was mauling people in the city. You know? So those are, those are the first two. And one thing that they both touched on was, oh, let's have all the words Right. Well, well, and another opening one is, is that, is to deflect, okay, so the idea, if one makes the association between the chimpanzee and the president, then it's actually your own twisted racist mind that's doing it. So, so those are the kind of, so those, are the, those are the three, so the three first talking points that they were told to get out, out there was to organize, to sort of organize this basic argument. Uh, so so they're, they're kind of four, right? So one, well, there's, there's, sort of, there's sort of one and two. So one and two is, is that this is sort of twisted racialized thinking. Um, Imposing something that you that 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 isn't there, or you're injecting race into something. Two, Obama. The third one. You know, the third one is. Okay. Don't don't be so sensitive. So, so, so there's, a, there's another strategy, right, that, that, that is actually part of the black conservative legacy, which is, on one hand, we don't want to talk about it. On the other hand, I'm going to justify what I say as being a, a black person, right? That emerges, which is an interesting strategy that could be used, which is, doesn't use it so later. Some other incidents of racism to deflect away from the the actual incident. That he, um, so all of a sudden he starts talking about has bearing on whether or not this incident was or was not Which is about some random incident in Texas. Seemingly has. It's almost a non sequitur, right? We're not. I mean, if CNN would have called us to talk about that, we would have sat there and talked about that, right? But they called us to talk about this. So, so one of the things is, is, so you can actually see, right? There's actually a startling symmetry between the use of these sets of talking points. You can actually see the workings of the machinery behind it, right? So they've both been probably drilled by the same person, um, who's 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 giving them this. And I think for some reason the the Clinton talking point, um, they didn't feel like that worked because Chris was one day before home was. So they, they felt like that talking point didn't work appropriately, so they switched it uh, to, to one that was a little more uh, serious. Here's, here's a strategy that's used 
which is filibuster, right? And you see her, she does it effectively, and he does it as well. The segment is only going to be so long. And if you're able to... from interrupting to that, that. So, so that's another another strategy is is, is not to debate politically but right um, see notice um, he's preventing them from going back to Gergen and why is he preventing them from going back to Gergen Gergen is a white man he's a republican Right, Gergen is a registered Republican, Republican White House also worked with him. So there's no kind of him from going to Gergen because Gergen has him. Who does he want to argue with? He wants to argue with Roland Martin because so the, the, the Roland Martin, uh, Ron Christie feels like, okay, they'll believe me more because I'm a black person going against the grain of what you expect a black person to say. Um, if, he, if he tries to have this argument with David Gergen, um, and in fact, in some ways, one of the ways in which, in which he tried to uh, deal with Gergen was to use American comment, right? So he wanted to move the discussion away from David Gergen. David Gergen doesn't have the sufficient expertise to talk about this or to call this racism. He's not black. Um, and so he wants to move the conversation away from David Gergen. And he so I did a search on uh, talking to the president. Or president's, and the president's stimulus bill, and I got about 200 million hits using that language. And you can see the headlines, President's Stimulus Bill, President's Stimulus Bill. I typed in Congress's stimulus package, Congress's stimulus bill, and the headlines came back, Congress passes President's stimulus package. <laughs> and I got almost nothing for Pelosi's stimulus package or Harry Reid's stimulus package, right? So the predominant framing of the bill in the media, the way everyone understands it, is that it, the, bill, the stimulus bill is associated with the president, right? We could, it, I, it's a thumbnail sort of methodological search as a real scholar. I could, I could pull that up and check what the sort of the predominant framing of it is. So again, he comes back to his, he comes back to his talking point. So, then there's a, there's a pivot away from, right, if, if I say something that's offensive to you, you can rightfully be offended by it, and you can be offended by it, even if I didn't offer an apology, whether I intended to my communication. What Christie is doing is twisting it. His another talking point is, is that they want you to. They, they want you to not think about this. They want you to think about the intent. Uh, if, if the offense was unintentional, you cannot take offense from it. And right. So, you ever really know the intent of the of the of the New York Post? We, we can never really entirely know the intent of the New York Post. All kinds of good reasons to say it's not our intent. In some ways, pointing out that something was 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 racially offensive, or that you or has been has has now become the offense. right. And his discussion. So so now the the actual cartoon isn't the offense. The offense is now those who pointed out or who challenge the 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 racist content of the cartoon itself that is the the offense is is actually bringing up a discussion of race and racism itself um, and that's what divides people not a cartoon that portray, potentially portrays an african american president as a monkey and and one of the things is 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 the sort of question about 
he uses this kind of jump. Everyone's got an opinion, right? So, so your opinion uh, is just as good as my opinion. It, it's all just opinion. We, we, we can't come to some kind of conclusion, but you should just walk away thinking that this is just noise. Um, That quote is not given its context, right? He goes on to talk about all the areas of public and social life that remain segregated and calls on people to think about uh, things we can do in our everyday lives and how we can kind of confront this and really challenge ourselves to try and interact with each other in more meaningful ways, right? But the quote is truncated there. <laughs> So she's his colleague. There's, so, so in some ways, like, there's a kind of incongruity. And normally, that really shouldn't be the case uh, in some ways. So segregation isn't so bad, <laughs> right? And you know, so it talks about the black colleges outside of the kind of the history and context of how those institutions came to be. There's a whole discourse. She doesn't like this point, right? It's too complicated for her. It's a it's a it's a difficult kind of thing to line on it. So it's just the thing with actually but try and sort of well, who is he talking about? She she knows he she calls it peculiar. So a spurious connection, right? So we go from questions around self segregation to the monkey cartoon. Um, So there's a shocking story there's a, 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 of about a chimpanzee who mauls a neighbor, and there's a stimulus bill. And they obviously have something to do with one another. At this point, I'm almost going to fall in the chair. But, but you know, you have, to, you have this thing. Here's what I'm trying to do is I wanted to make her angry because one of the ways in which the, these things always play out is, is that the person talking about racism or racist behavior is always portrayed as the angry one and the defensive one. Because they like to put the camera on Amy, right? She's, very, she's, she's cute, you know, that kind of thing. So, so the camera likes her, and so like, okay, so let, me, let me put her on the defensive for the whole rest of this thing, right? Like, let me just, let me just do that. So I, so I came up with the line, um, when you try and defend the indefensible, um, you just sound foolish, right? It, 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 I mean, you're, you're, it, 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 that's all that can be said about it. So, so, and my, my mom actually said that she looked like, when I said it, she looked like I slapped her, right, for a second. And then she kind of got her, okay, yeah, I'll go back. Because she, did, she didn't really expect it, it's very clear. So, so, when beaten, change the subject, right? Let's start talking about some random black man in Le Lexington, Texas that got shot. And that's really what we should be talking about. Yeah. No, they, they, they all from the Booker in the morning, and they said, "We'd like you to go on. Can you go on in, with Amy Holmes? Uh, we want to talk about, you know, Eric Holder and this chimpanzee cartoon. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can talk about that. So, okay." So then, that's all. That's what I know. Going. She may. She may. I don't. I don't know. She may know. You know, her media consultant may say, "Well, what what kinds of questions is he going to ask?" Or you know, and she may get that kind of information. I don't. I don't know. Um, so I don't know if she. No, 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 he can't. I mean, he's not going to respond to foolishness like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. So, so I just wanted to show you, like, in, in terms of, I mean, more sort of the instructive idea around this was 
first of all, the sort of black conservative talking points about kind of racism isn't so bad, calling out racism kind of perpetuates the problem. We saw this with sort of Klan. But also one of the things that I wanted to show you was is the sort of the, the almost sort of hidden hand of the uh, machinery that operates behind uh, the inordinate access that black conservatives have to media outlets, right? So if, if you think about that, the equation would be you would assume that like roughly, you know, half of black people are conservative and half of them are, you know, some other sort of ideology, but obviously not conservative, uh, who would disagree with this. And obviously that's not, there's no symmetry um, there. And in fact, whose views are much more representative of most black people, mine are, or Roland Martin is, uh, Roland Martin works for CNN, but see in this context, like I don't even work for CNN, so Amy Holmes is on CNN 10 times more than I am. Um, so the, so, but the point is, is that, is that that point of view is given a kind of inordinate amount, and it's done um, in part by the sort of workings of these these conservative foundations, uh, who uh, operate a machinery um, that you could see with sort of Holmes and Christie, um, and it's almost I mean you could see that someone wrote those talking points, they rehearsed them, they were ready to go, they they, they were they were set pieces. Uh, that were set up for them to to operate out of, um, and that and that and that's part of sort of perpetuating um, the appearance of sort of black conservatives in the in the public sphere is this this machinery that that provides this kind of access, um, and so so Amy Holmes doesn't her job is to do that. Um, that's her job. Uh, Ron Christie, that's his job. Um, so their, their jobs are to go on and to put these sort of talking points uh, from a black face out into the public sphere. And there's people who are willing to pay them lots of money uh, to do that. And so they don't have to earn a living in the other ways other than being black conservatives uh, and to, to, to go into these sort of outlets. Um, and so, that, so these foundations sort of pick up these people and they create uh, this whole thing. For instance, like if I, if I were to show you the Independent Women's Forum that uh, Michelle Bernard, who regularly appears on MSNBC, is in charge of, they have this whole thing about of scholars, right? They, they have a whole list of scholars um, that are supposedly like the scholars associated with the Independent Women's Forum. Not a one of them has a PhD. Not a one of them has a job at a, a credible university, right? It, it's basically, and the Independent Women's Forum is basically a, um, it's a secular version of, uh, to sort of get conservative talking points from a kind of secular perspective from a series of other organizations uh, to promote uh, conservative women talking about policy and in the media uh, that, are, that, that come from the perspective of the religious right. Um, this particular one is a kind of, is a kind of secular organization. Um, and so, and the other part is, is that there aren't necessarily really analogous organizations uh, on, you know, the left or that, that have that, that kind of sort of money and support and access. So, you know, I finished class here. I met with a couple of, of students and colleagues. I got in my car. I drove to the studio. I didn't, have, I didn't have a consultant in my ear the whole way, sort of having crafted and rehearsing a set of talking points. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you have to make a, draw a strong distinction between, um, and this is one of the things that currently in sort of the media that's being collapsed, uh, and you can even see it a little bit with sort of Rick Sanchez, is that you, you have to draw a strong distinction between Soledad O'Brien, who is a journalist, right? She is an investigative journalist. She does a whole set of different sort of investigative pieces. Um, rather than Amy Holmes is not a journalist. She is a person who is paid to give her opinions. Um, and so you have to draw a distinction between the two. I'm also there to give my opinions, uh, but I'm offering, and, and that's a distinction, I'm offering opinions as a kind of expert in the subject, uh, 
versus I'm still not quite clear what Amy Holmes' expertise is, other than uh, she's black. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a whole there's a whole sort of kind of communication apparatus um and there's a whole sort of set of media training and a whole set of things that like are designed um to help, you know, prepare people to go into these kinds of forums and and operate in a certain way and and someone like Amy Holmes is also picked not because she's you know particularly married to like they picked her right out of undergrad to start doing this and it's because she's she's attractive um and so and she looks good on camera and the camera's gonna like to focus on her people will like to see her um so that that's one of the that's one of the kind of the things that sort of uh distinguishes and um and yeah there isn't a kind of analogous um set of apparatus of this on the other side, so you end up with someone, someone like me, who's just not really a, a, a media person per se. Like I don't have, I've never gone to like media training school or whatever. I mean, the extent of it is, is that like if I do, I have a friend that I went to high school with uh, who was briefly a reporter on television news, and sometimes, like at one time before I did my first live shot, I just called her and said, "Okay, what am I, what am I supposed to do?" Uh, how do I sit, you know, what, you know, and she just gave me like about three or four tips over the phone and then, uh, and that's it. And then, you know, you sort of watch yourself and you, and you can kind of bend it in terms of what other people do and how they do it. But the, but it, but it's a very different thing. It's a, it's a very different set of, um, set of differences between, you know, and besides that, I also have a regular job. I have to prepare lectures and, you know, I'm not just sitting there in the morning, uh, preparing for to go on CNN. I'm doing a bunch of other things. Um, so yeah, there isn't a, a kind of consistent apparatus. But so one of the things is is that is that this creates a, a kind of this kind of asymmetry in political debates. But what I wanted to what I wanted to demonstrate to you guys is that there's a lot of political talk out there um, and a lot of different sort of ideological perspectives. Um, one of your classmates uh, asked me to put this one up. This is. Uh, one of the people from the Black Forum debating uh, Pat Buchanan. Um, and you can also see in terms of how Pat Buchanan is also prepared with a series of talking points uh, to respond to the whole comment. And Pat Buchanan obviously isn't a black conservative. He's a conservative conservative. Uh, some people would call him a paleo conservative. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I was hoping that Pat Buchanan might start talking about Mexicans in this one. Uh, it might have it might have squared the circle, but. So here we get actually a longer take. This is MSNBC. Network is a little more left. MSNBC gives you a little more context. Um, for the quote, so you get a little more context in the quote. So, and you can see how these subtle framing differences across networks are, are, are very interesting. So, CNN and, and, and Fox, you probably only heard, "We're a nation of cowards." <laughs> you probably just saw that, but that, that's a kind of framing thing. So, we have Michael Eric Dyson, Pat Buchanan. Um, so we're going to have a kind of liberal, conservative, black, white kind of perspective. Uh, and here goes, here it goes. So one, actually one nice thing about this is um, how's Dyson here framed? He's in the office, there's books, there's flags. It gives him a kind of a, a certain amount of gravitas. Um, I'm assuming that this is an uh, uplink studio at Georgetown University. The Georgetown 
has its own spot on campus, so he doesn't have to go to the MSNB, the NBC studios. There's probably this is a a, a stage uh, set up at Georgetown University. So if you ever see another expert from Georgetown, look to see if you see this background. Um, if you see anyone from Princeton, usually they'll be behind that orange background. It'll say Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson School. Like if you see uh, Paul Krugman or uh, generally also Melissa Harris Lacewell, uh, they'll be standing there. So what's his line coming directly out of? This sort of democracy perfecting itself, achieving its, its ultimate goal. What? He's a radical egalitarian, right? This is a, the radical egalitarian line. He's giving it to you uh, directly. So, so how is Barnacle setting this up? Us against you, and white guys are the victims in conversations about race, right? White guys get victimized if they bring up the topic. White guys like you and so me. On right? one hand, right, he's, OK, so this is a kind of libertarian conservative line. On the one hand, we've done so much to incorporate people of color into the American thing. But on the other hand, Pat Buchanan has fought against every single one of those things, right? The Civil Rights Bill, uh, affirmative action, all of the sets of things that have allowed for desegregation. Um, Pat Buchanan has fought against every single one of those things. But on the one hand, he wants to say he wants to be so oh so proud of what's happened. So, yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so that that we did. That we did for you. Right, right, right. So, so, so it, it was, who, who were the agents, right? It, it isn't this idea that people had to sort of fight for this from the bottom up. It's that we sort of did this to you. We gave it to you. So, um, w one thing is, is the comment about the nation of cowards was talking about everyone, right? It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't simply about whites. Um, and there's a sort of interesting way in which, in which you know, Buchanan is sort of taking that and sort of taking it as. You just, the defensiveness is, is, is very strong. It meant that everyone needed to have a much more open conversation. Wow. <laughs> so he had that ready, right? He, he, that was a set piece. That was a set set of talking points that, so, so those statistics in and of themselves discredit any conversation about, um, as spurious as even some of those statistics are, discredit any conversation about racism or any discussion about that racism might play a role in, uh, or poverty might play a role in, in any of those issues. So, I mean, I'd almost think this is a conspiracy. Um, but, and one of the things is, is one thing that, that Dyson is losing, though, a little bit is, is he let, he let Buchanan get him angry, right? And, and, there's a way in which, like, the rant that Buchanan went on would, would really offend and turn a lot of people off, right? Even people who might be inclined to, to sort of, but, and, and, and Tyson's, Dyson's not, not using that. Um, he, he, he missed the kind of opportunity to use the kind of coarseness of, of Buchanan's rant um, to kind of turn it against him. Uh, he's kind of responding in kind. Right, he's gonna he's gonna up the ante right with Buchanan. So there's gang rape, <laughs> gang assaults. Right, he draws, um, and in and in particular, right, the 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 charge of the sort of black male rapist uh, is one of the sort of critical racist charges that that was that was lodged around lynching. We talked about Emmett Till. So so Pat Buchanan goes back to um, an extraordinarily kind of traditional sort of racist stereotype. Uh, about you know, and uses the term gang rape. Uh, so so they're organized gangs of black men to rape women ostensibly, and then he I think he starts talking about white people. So ostensibly, when everyone knows that the majority of sexual assault is is um, is intraracial, uh, you're most likely to be sexually assaulted. Women are most likely to be sexually assaulted by someone that they know, uh, and most likely someone of their own uh, racial or ethnic background. Uh, than they are by a stranger or someone from another racial ethnic background. So, so white people are rightfully racist because black people commit crimes against white people, uh, and that and that 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 um, that 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 statistic is absolutely out of whack completely. Um, and directness that, that that actually sort of represents what you know, kind of a lot of the way a lot of people you know, probably talk about these issues. 
Um, but at the same time, um, the, um, the, the sort of coarseness of that presentation um, doesn't match. So if Michael Dyson has to talk with, with Amy Holmes, it's a very different conversation that he has to have, right? There's a, there's a very different dynamic about, about how she can spin the argument, how she can discredit him. And it isn't this sort of, uh, it isn't this sort of, she's not going to come, she's not going to be as sort of coarse and direct um, as Pat Buchanan. She's not going to talk about, you know, black men gang raping. You know, I mean, I mean, he just, you know, it's just like, all of a sudden, it's like you poke him and he just, you know, throws out a series of like, the sort of base, the basic kind of, um, the sort of basic unvarnished, like, racist lines. Right, they just they just all come out, and 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 then it, it actually it's a really it's a different kind of conversation than the much more you know sort of slick um, sort of use of. Um, I'm going to use this to kind of segue into a little bit of what we're going to talk about on Thursday, which is um, one of the other legacies and one of the other things that Pat Buchanan frequently talks about is. Uh, I think I think uh, I think Rachel Maddow refers to him as is her 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 favorite uncle because I think I think um, as a kind of you know as a kind of lesbian feminist um, I think she kind of finds his his uh, that kind of unvarnished thing also kind of intriguing um, to her as well in terms of in terms of Pat Buchanan um, but one of the other the other trends that we can talk about that frequently appears or at least appears somewhat is uh, questions of black feminism, um, and one of the one of the just to sort of to set up the kind of discussion of black feminism, um, black feminism often and, and feminism in general um, don't get much of a kind of unvarnished hearing uh, in sort of mainstream media outlets, um, and in particular. Uh, so I'm actually the what we're going to watch is a, is a debate on uh, democracy now, uh, and this is a debate on the left uh, between black and white feminist perspectives uh, about how do we understand the the relationship or the competing interests of race and gender, uh, and how and how do we how do we mute, meld them together or how do we not? Um, this, uh, the provocation for this particular clip, if I, if I can ever log in, let me see if I can use this computer instead. Uh, the provocation for the clip that I'm going to show you was uh, shortly after uh, then Senator, or at least candidate, uh, Obama's win in, um, after his win in, in Iowa, um, sort of feminist icon Gloria Steinem. Uh, former editor of Ms. Magazine, uh, a, kind of, a kind of leading uh, advocate of feminist perspectives. I think it may be down for a minute. It does that regularly. Um, came out with an article in the New York uh, Times that argued, um, that attempted to argue, uh, it, it made the argument that women are never front runners. Um, and that was the title of it. And it made this argument that, uh, one, Hillary Clinton wasn't winning because of sexism. Um, two, that, um, that sexism was, was fueling the debate. That if Barack Obama was a black woman, he wouldn't be in the position he's in. Um, and so therefore, uh, really, and that really, and, and then it sort of suggested that there's, there's nothing, in fact, it even suggested, uh, she even writes in the article that black men were giving the vote uh, before white women were, um, without even mentioning the fact that uh, later on, uh, white women were giving the vote long, and, and black men were lynched, uh, and both black men and women were disenfranchised uh, from, from being able to vote. So she, she, she makes us to try and sort of argue that gender is a much more significant locus of oppression than race is. Um, and so many people, I, I actually remember I was in, um, I, I was reading it on my, um, I was walking and I was actually in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I saw that article 
um, up here on my thing after the, the win, and I said, oh no, this is gonna start a really nasty and divisive debate, um, because it was an exact mirror of a charge that black feminists had been lodging for a time, argued that, that white women were, um, their white feminists were unwilling uh, to consider the problems of racial oppression. And what I'm trying to show Okay, so we'll scrub that. We'll do it later if I ever get uh, online. So, but one of the things is, is it, it, it set up a, uh, a series of arguments and debates that sort of work through the campaign about um, what was the legacy of racism uh, and versus the legacy of gender oppression. Uh, and can we talk about either one? Famously, uh, Geraldine Ferraro said, um, you know, the former vice president candidate, um, that, you know, Barack Obama would never be where he was if he wasn't a black man. The only reason he's been so successful is because he's black. Um, and the suggestion was always, and of course, um, that Clinton was suffering from sexism. So, of course, again, the argument was uh, on this part. Uh, was that that uh, gender oppression was much more important or salient uh, than racial oppression. Um, there was also a piece that ended up having to be pulled down uh, by CNN, a short article and piece that asked, um, that, that suggested or, 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 or drew a contrast and said, what will black women do? How will they choose? Um, will they either choose their race or their gender, and within actually hours, um, so many black women wrote in and found it offensive uh, that CNN actually pulled it down. Um, and that what they were writing was is that, uh, first of all, we don't choose our, either our race or gender, we inhabit both as we move through the world. Um, and second, our political choices and discussions cannot be sort of boiled down to us choosing which of our preferred identity. We have a complicated way of thinking about, about politics in the world that's beyond uh, whether we are simply women or are or, or simply our race. And this, this proceeded, um, I would say that, you know, one of the, the sort of fascinating things about sort of teaching these things now um, in this kind of moment is, is that uh, we've had about a year and a half of an almost unprecedented conversation uh, about race. and. Um, and including, which was an unprecedented conversation about the relationship between race and gender oppression. So this is a, a combined lecture. I'm not going to do the popular culture part today. I'll, I'll pick up because uh, one of the questions is, is one of the interesting things, and in popular culture is one of the places where I think black women uh, are most denigrated uh, and where you find the, uh, the most sexism. We'll talk about some of those kinds of imagery. Uh, so here's a host of black feminists, uh, Angela Davis, uh, Alice Walker, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan. Um, so here, what are the core ideas of black feminism? Or sometimes black feminists have wanted to distance themselves uh, from feminism, uh, suggesting uh, that feminism was a white middle class movement uh, and have often, have sometimes called it womanism. Uh, and first, black feminists see race uh, is a central point of oppression. Gender is a problem in the black community. Um, and they frequently argue for a kind of intersection, right? That, that they are, they face multiple layers of oppression. Um, they face racism from whites. They face sexism in the broader community, both from white men, but also from black men um, who are equally capable of committing um, offenses in
significant for you. Um, and that is a, a kind of standard set of core ideas of black feminism. Um, and then depending upon others, there's differing degrees to which they address uh, questions of uh, class and sexuality uh, as being sort of central problems that also need to be struggled against. But the idea is to think more expansively. There is no single category above all that is a locus for oppression, and that defines uh, the perspective that you read somewhat about uh, that we now call intersectionality. There are historic moments. Um, the women's suffrage movement, uh, which uh, explicitly, for the most part, uh, tended to exclude black women. Um, and in fact, the women's suffrage movement uh, explicitly, at points, uh, took a racist stance um, in saying, particularly around the, the era of Reconstruction, uh, some women suffragists uh, were quoted as saying, uh, you have given Sambo the vote. Um, why can't white women have it? Um, which was a kind of, you know, Sambo was obviously a kind of racist reference to black men. Uh, and so the idea was is that, the, so frequently um, the women's suffrage movement, in particular white women involved in it, um, made the argument that white women should be given the vote to counteract or to in, in denigration of the fact that black men had been given the, the, the vote. Uh, so it wasn't a sort of argument that we too should have the vote, there should be universal suffrage, but the idea is that you've given it to this undeserving class of people, uh, we are more deserving than they are. Um, there's also been black women played a major role in the anti-lynching movement, yes. Well, it wasn't Susan B. Anthony herself, but other, but there, but there were significant streams in that particular. Um, there were connections at times between the abolitionist movement and the feminist movement, uh, of which of which Frederick Douglass saw himself a part of. But there was also significantly a strand in feminist movements that always that, that consistently argued against black citizenship rights and sort of used a kind of framing of counterposing. Uh, and those were always sort of competing discourses and, and consistently have been competing discourses over history uh, within sort of feminist uh, movements. This is how do we deal with either the question of black women and or black men? Um, and, and including, uh, I'll talk about some other parts, but um, so also there's the anti-lynching movement. Um, and one of the things, I think you, you read some, some stuff about Angela Davis. Um, one of the things that was even mo most complicated for, and has continued to be most complicated for feminists about the anti-lynch movement was is the fact that, that, that a lot of lynchings were based around uh, the sort of frame up rape charge um, against, if you look at the Scottsboro case, uh, et cetera, that we talked about earlier, um, the frame up rape charge was used frequently against black men to justify lynching. Um, and so feminists have often wanted to talk about sexual assault or sexual violence uh, but black feminists, including uh, people like Angela Davis, let's let this pass. <laughs> let's hope everything's okay. Um, feminists like Angela Davis and others um, have frequently said that, that, that feminist movements need to take this into account to understand how uh, the cult of white womenhood was used uh, for lynching in particular. And you had people like Ida B. Wells who has pointed that out. But Ida B. Wells herself uh, is an interesting por portrait in black feminists. So she was challenging uh, this particular aspect of uh, racism, but was herself marginalized at the, in the Niagara movement created by W.E.B. Du Bois uh, because of being a woman. Uh, so she faced sexism within the African-American community, even while she was one of the leading crusaders uh, against racism and, in particular, racist treatment of black men. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement stuck a, uh, had, a, had a similar stance. Um, you rarely see uh, black women um, at the front of the marches, though, in particular, critical black women like Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and others uh, were, were central figures 
uh, and doing most of the day-to-day -day and grassroots organizing, uh, as well as were the people who, who, were, who had hoses turned against them, et cetera. Um, so you see a kind of way in which black women were marginalized, uh, were, were even while fighting against sexism uh, and for the greater good of the black community, were marginalized because of sexist attitudes uh, amongst black men and, and amongst black leadership. Uh, the feminist movement itself uh, has frequently marginalized black women or uh, taken up what is perceived to be sort of, sort of white feminist concerns. For instance, uh, one sort of criticism of the mainstream feminist movement by black women is, is that black women have never had to fight to get into the workplace. Uh, black women have always been uh, laborers all the way back from slavery uh, through domestic labor. Their labor has been required uh, in order to maintain uh, black households. Um, and so the, the, the idea wasn't, has never been, in fact, for, for, and some of them say, has never been, can black women into the workplace? It, the question is, is on what terms uh, and where would black women uh, apply their labor? Um, and frequently, uh, particularly in the South, the, the predominant form of labor that black women had access to was either agricultural labor or domestic labor uh, for middle, uh, upper, and working class white women, uh, many of whom were not working themselves, uh, working outside of the homes. They would have a black woman who would do those kinds of things. Um, another historic moment um, in the, the, the struggle for black feminism is the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings. What is that? Okay, it's an ambulance. It's okay. So someone. It, if it was police cars, I was going to say, look, we need to, <laughs> okay, well, maybe we do need to be worried. They haven't sent out those, like, random emails yet, have they? Um, so one of, the, one of the major incidents in sort of black feminist uh, issues is the Clarence Thomas and Eda Hill hearings. Uh, this was a problem where we saw uh, a black man, and many people said, oh, well, you know, this is Anita Hill just trying to bring a black Sensible uh, 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 wrote an op-ed saying you just didn't understand what Clarence Thomas was doing as part of black culture and the banter that goes on. Uh, it wasn't meant to be used that way. Um, even actually Maya Angelou uh, uh, supported uh, Clarence Thomas uh, in his hearings against against Anita Hill. So it was a very divisive and complicated issue. Uh, people took. Uh, So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there and sort of say, so there's been this kind of historical clash, and, and the clash is multifold. So role is there. Um, and in both cases, there's been a substantial amount of struggle uh, and difficulty in doing so, as well as a um, a lot of kinds of hurt feelings and, and acrimony. Um, and in particular, some of that acrimony um, has always been around a series of issues. And, and one thing about uh, in black communities that has always been an issue for we'll talk about this a little bit more later is, is that um, one of the dominant portrayals of black women in general, right? Did you see uh, Patrick Cannon, one of the most out of wedlock first?
because of the fact um, that, that that violence is played as confirming stereotypes about black men. face a kind of a kind of difficulty and face a difficulty etc Dramatically in the sort of events surrounding uh, the Grammys recently, kind of, kind of discourse about it. Um, so here's what I'm going to show you is it's going to set up at least uh, sort of part of it is uh, on um, the uh, public television radio set up very left show Democracy Now! is one place where you can actually see uh, a very left wing black feminist debate a very left wing white feminist really disagree. Here, actually, Melissa Harris Lacewell, who is a good friend uh, and fellow political scientist uh, of great renown at Princeton University, uh, debating uh, feminist icon uh, Gloria Steinem. We'll end on part one, and we'll probably pick up part two next time. Let me pause. Let's see if it'll spool up a little bit. Um, so just to set this up, this show is Democracy Now. It, uh, it's on KPFK. What's KPFK? 97.1. Um, this is the left of left of left. Uh, so left, I can actually hardly listen to it. it, it it's, you know, I like to get a little bit of uh, both sides um, and a little bit of balance. Uh, and this is responding to uh, Gloria Steinem's article saying, uh, Hillary Clinton is suffering from sexism. Uh, Barack Obama has this huge advantage because he's a man, uh, and if he were a black woman, he wouldn't he wouldn't be where he is today. Results from Iowa and New Hampshire. Let's see. Results from Iowa and New Hampshire have placed Senators Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama as. <laughs> uh, we're having a hard time getting off here, so let me, let me see if it'll just spool up. Um, Okay, here it comes. We're starting to get some speed now. We get to end with. Uh, it'll be interesting. Like in five, years, we, this, we have these same sort of infrastructure problems. It's like we're sort of almost the equivalent of like you know two tin cans in a train, right? So we'll finish this on Thursday.